Welcome to Reframe the Podcast, helping you reframe your thought patterns, habits and mindsets to create the life that you want to lead. In this, which is the ultimate episode of Series 1 of Reframe, I am chatting with non-diet fitness professional Karen Preen. Now, I've followed Karen for a long time, and to be quite frank, I have her in the bloody brilliant person box in my head. She is fabulous. She gives so much value out. She, Her content is thought-provoking, inspiring, challenging. Now, this chat is yeah, it's everything. I have to be honest. Um, it's probably my favourite of the series. So here we go. This is Karen Preen and I talking about breaking down stigma across the health profession. Hi, Karen, and welcome to Reframe Club today. It is such a pleasure to have you here. Um, I've been following you on Instagram for quite some time and your work and you've been um, a real inspiration to me, but also I've learned a lot from you. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have you here today but for our members who um, perhaps haven't followed you or seen you before I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and what it is that you do. I can and, and hi to you and thank you for having me on. Um, so my name's Karen and I'm 40. I like to get that in because um, I think it's important that we showcase women of uh, an older age. Um, I'm a single mom of two and I'm a non-diet fitness professional with my own small business. Um, I'm all, I also like to say that I'm, I'm actually in receipt of Universal Credit at the moment. I'm on their 12-month startup program because it's important to me as well as the work I do to break the stigma around parents on um, government um, benefits. So yeah. I do like to talk about that as part of who I am. <laughs> No, that absolutely, and it's really important, I think you say, and I think a lot of the work you said yourself about the non-diet approach to fitness, and we'll, um, it might be nice to kind of, people who follow me will understand the non-diet approach from a nutrition point of view, but mm-hmm. how that kind of like plays out into fitness, but also I think the whole movement around health at every size and non-diet, it ebbs out it's so much wider, doesn't it? It's, we, we, we talk yeah. about stigma in every kind of shape and form, don't we, mm-hmm. in terms of society as well. Yeah, because the, um, that's the part of it. it. Like The stigma is across all health professionals. Yeah. Um, but I fo- obviously, I'm a fitness professional, so I focus in on that. Because also as well, whilst you're learning, you understand that this affects so many different areas um, and you can become a bit overwhelmed so I do think it's about finding how it affects the area that you're involved in so for me my focus has been on um, how that um, looks in regards to fitness and exercise and movement. And how did you come to here then so how did you come did what came first for you was it your career in health and exercise or was it an interest in non-diet kind of which one informed the other? Well, um, it was my career in exercise. So I was already a fitness professional. I qualified in 2015, probably 2014. And then I started. um, So I was a fitness instructor to begin with. I started in my local community. I was doing outdoor fitness sessions. um, And then that evolved into women's fitness sessions at the gym where I was training, kickboxing. So I was already a fitness professional. And... I was probably one foot in, one foot out of diet culture. I already knew that it didn't feel quite right. There was something not quite quite connecting. I already was coming up against um, other professionals within the industry. Um, the messages just weren't sitting well. But I, I, I didn't know what to do with that information or that feeling because there was no other way to approach fitness that I knew of then. Yeah. But then body positivity started to become more mainstream and I had so I'd started to learn more about body positivity but um I do like to be transparent that it was the whitewashed version that I yeah first came across you know the self-love body confidence didn't really know much about the political side of it um so I and then I started university and I came across the health at every size research whilst I was studying exercise and health at university and that was when I kind of opened the doors to oh my goodness this this is another approach that feels so much more aligned to what I already believed 
And for people who don't know, could you, would you mind like giving a kind of like snapshot of what health every size means? Yeah. So I did, for transparency, I did take some information from the ASDAH website, which is the Association for Size, Diversity and Health. Um, And they, it's, to me, it's an alternative approach to health in my line of work. It's an alternative approach to building a relationship with exercise and movement. Um, And they define it as a continuously evolving alternative to weight centric approach. It's also a movement and to promote size acceptance, to end weight stigma, and to lessen the cultural obsession with weight loss and thinness. Um, And I translate it as, it's a way for us to explore benefits of exercise movement without the narrative and the toxicity of diet culture. So it's almost like a reclamation, I, I see it as a reclamation of, of movement, yeah. really, without love the that. pressure of weight loss or thinness yeah. or body changes. You know, um, it just takes a whole lot of pressure off and you get to mm. explore fitness in a way that means something integral to you. Yeah, massively. And I think I love the way you encapsulated that because it's exactly that, because what I don't know how you found it, but I almost found like diet culture, especially in, in fitness and in um, even nutrition, it kind of decouples us from our body. We become yeah. like really cerebral about it. And we like, we don't, we don't listen. We don't tune in anymore to whether or not it's benefiting mm-hmm. us or not. We just take these ex- external validators, you know, did the rings close on my Apple watch? Did, a, did the yeah. needle on the scale move? What are my gains? You know, all of that when actually movement and how it feels that kind of um from a nutrition point of view we talk about body food congruence but body movement congruence actually Mm -hmm. is so much wider than that isn't it and it's that whole thing about health versus weight that Mm -hmm. weight centric approach versus a health centric approach and that the, the benefits of movement when we begin to look at them aside of body shape and size are really wide reaching aren't they yeah Yep, mentally, physically, emotionally, but even spiritually, because I, I kind of see movement that it can be meditative, that it can be embodying. You know, I find it really a good way to bring myself back to myself, mm. if that makes mm. sense, because you can become really aware of your body. Um, and whereas I didn't have any of those values around it when I was deep in dark culture myself, um, it was all about, like you say, those external pressures and and a lot of the time I would, it's either an all or nothing approach as well, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, and one of the reasons as well, I think was whilst I came over to this approach myself was I was getting to that stage where it's like, what am I willing to actually give? Like, how much more can I give to stay thin? <laughs> Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it was, no, yeah. It was, it just became absolutely exhausting. Um, so I think I'd reach my diet rock bottom. Yeah. And so how did that, I mean, if you feel comfortable sharing kind of like what, how did that manifest for you? You're obviously within a gym, were you working in a gym, like a gym culture, um, kind of embedded in it? How was it? How did it look? What did that look like for you? Well, I wasn't working in the gym then. What happened is I was working casually in a gym and then I went to university full time 2016 Um, but I was powerlifting and okay. powerlifting is weight categorized. Um, so you had to stay in a certain, well, you didn't have to, but it, it became where you felt like you had to stay in a certain weight category in order to have a chance to qualify for nationals. Um, and I was, I was finding it harder and harder to stay in this weight category because it, it's almost like my body was fighting against itself. I was training very hard my body obviously needed more fuel my I was putting on muscle mass so all of this would would obviously add to how much your body weighs because you know you're increasing mass which is totally normal but it's almost like I was trying to fight against this natural biological fact yeah um and that and the last time that I had to make my in I'm not I won't even discuss because it was very disordered but that was my like this is not normal you know so 
you know, a lot of things seem to happen together because I lost my mum suddenly too. So, like, she she died um, unexpectedly. She was only 58. And I do think that kind of brings you a lot of perspective as well. Like, how much time am I going to spend on this earth trying to be thin when, in the grand scheme of things, it's just miserable? Yeah. So, yeah, a, there was a few factors. Yeah, and that's such a powerful... And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you had to, you know, you had to experience that lost with your mum and 58 is a really young age mm -hmm. there's no words that's just it's not fair um but equally as you say when we can make that breakthrough I read some horrendous statistic the other day about um a woman spends on average 17 years on a diet of their life 17 years imagine what you could do with that back that time that energy how you would do things differently. Mm -hmm. if we just said, oh, here's more than a decade and a half back. And I don't yeah. think until people see it black and white because it's so insidious, isn't it? It becomes part of those, they're just thoughts we have all the time. You go out to the sandwich shop at lunchtime and you're looking at the food labels and you're not choosing the sandwich you want, you're choosing the one that you think is going to yeah. fit. You know, it's that energy, that constant mental energy as women mm -hmm. that we're constantly giving over. And I tend to jump on my patriarchy soapbox about this because I really do believe it keeps us small I think you know if women are underfed yeah. then you know and all our time and energy is caught up in this meeting this idea which shifts all the I mean even in my lifetime I've lived through all these different fashionable body shapes I'm the same age as mm -hmm. you Karen and you think we we're never going to achieve it I'm never going to be all of these things to all of these people yeah exactly and even in our lifetime it's changed like you know when i was young it was like you know slim skinny thighs and nobody every it was all like oh does my bum look big in this and now it's all changed like, again now you know yeah so Peach even and... within our lifetime yeah and then, and then it's going to change again so and and you're right what you said about the way that it holds us back look it wasn't just about dieting and maintaining thinness it was lack of confidence you know keeping you very small i was scared to show up I didn't really know my voice. I didn't have a voice. Um, is it, I do believe that, that it keeps you preoccupied, distracted, and yeah. um, what's the word? Compliant, you know, docile. You just, yeah. you're just going along with life and you're not really fully participating in it. No, and that does, and that kind of self-moderation we're taught to be, to be quiet compliant modest you know all of those things yeah absolutely and I remember once standing in Greg's um yes because I do I work in nutrition and I eat Greg's it's fine um <laughs> standing in Greg's and um watching men and women come in differently and I was getting a breakfast thing with my one of those days where you're really late for school and you mm -hmm. say to your kids if you leave now if you leave now we'll stop at Greg's yeah. Get something on the way. Get out the door. <laughs> yeah, I promise you can have a bacon roll and a hot chocolate from Greg's if we can get out the door. So we were doing that and we were there and I watched all these men come in, these guys who were working obviously contractors, you know, up early, getting their cup of tea and, and they all came in and they all just ordered. They all just ordered, I'll have a bacon roll, cup of tea, I'll have a cup of coffee and a sausage bap. And off they went. And I and in that moment I it really struck me the freedom they had or felt they just it wasn't even there there was no standing in front of the counter thinking it was just I'll have I'll take I'll eat I'll move on with my day yeah and I it's thought amazing. It was just yeah <laughs> it's the difference yeah. yeah well um I'll tell you something else that helped me a little bit as well um I, I dated I started dating a strong man in 2017 and they you know he, he ate and there was never any judgment of what I ate I was, you know, it would encourage me to like eat more. Um, and that really helped for the first time ever to have a partner that wasn't judgmental about the amount or type of food that I was eating. In fact, it was actively encouraged. Um, so I found that quite helpful too. Like almost like not, not that you have to wait for someone else to give you permission, but it's certainly helpful when you've got a partner who, you know, because in my past experience, I was with partners who would comment on my weight and would comment on 
how my body looked and I felt like I had to look a certain way to be acceptable to them. Whereas obviously my partner was, was not like that at all. So that was very refreshing and that helped yeah. a lot. Yeah. And it, and it goes back to that thing about who and what we surround ourselves with mm-hmm. and even social media. Like what yeah. are we feeding ourselves in that space? Whose messages are we taking on board? And sometimes, you know, what can look, overtly like a really kind of oh I'm really positive and I'm a really healthy message blah de blah and you did a post it was it a tweet the other day that you cut or a post the other day on Instagram about about this brings us back to the body positivity movement and it kind of being co-opted a little bit yeah. and you know I know you have some quite strong thoughts on that and from my point of view I kind of tried to stay away from body positivity because I feel like that's not my that's not my space yeah, I'm a thin exactly, white yeah. middle class woman this is not my space I shouldn't be in it mm-hmm. so I don't use those kind of hashtags or anything like that but I see them popping up all the time and in my line of work so I'm trained in the application of intuitive eating as a framework um I've noticed since the conversations we had over email especially on reels um I'm seeing white really thin women in crop tops mm-hmm. doing reels about if you're hungry just eat it and all of this and I think oh no a minute why are you showing your why are you why are you in your swimsuit with a slice of pizza this is not it's, it's this counterintuitive kind of so you think you're following something that's supportive or supporting you but actually mm-hmm. that's not diverse and as you say it's that whitewashed face of yeah it, but it's also that um it's still a space that's being co-opted by women who look like us. In- mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and like part of it is, you know what, it's really good to showcase women eating pizza, you know, yeah, yeah. and without a care in the world, eat your pizza, but don't do it within the body positive space. So it's more, you yeah. don't have to use those hashtags, you know, yeah. um, because that's, one you know we need to talk about the ways that we take up space and I was guilty of it myself I used to hashtag body positivity it's important for us to you know recognize yeah, how we've absolutely. learned and grown um and then I from following fat activists um you realize that actually you're causing erasure within the movement then because you're taking up space within a movement that was not supposed to center your body and that is where we learn how can we be part of the community and be supportive without centering ourselves? And that is where, like, you know, we don't use the hashtags, we share other people's work, you know, rather than rewording it on our own, you share and you give credit um, and we support their messages and their work. And so you get a lot of pushback from the thin community that, you know, body positivity is for, for all bodies and, and whilst that may be true that it, the goal is for us all, you know, to reach, um, to be part of the body positivity community, but it's about being part of it without causing harm and taking up space. Um, so that was where I had to do my reflections of how like, seeing um, a thin person visibly struggle with their body, how does that impact somebody who may be in, um, you know, a larger body who's also struggling and getting all kinds of messages from society that there is something wrong with their body? So, you know, it, when you think yeah. of it in that way, it can yeah. be harmful and we really should no. consider the way that we take up space. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think part of my journey was exactly that. I mean, when I first, um, I've shared it very openly in this, this arena but also on other people's podcasts about my own eating disorder I had um, quite severe anorexia through my late teens and early 20s but still going on a journey of recognizing that whilst I had a battle with my own body I had thin privilege I didn't have to I still don't get judged for what I eat and I don't have to worry about sitting in a particular seat or any of those things and as you say making that bringing that awareness Mm -hmm. is is really important and how you turn what are good intentions and it's not to say that the people in that space don't have good intentions but into meaningful action and as you say that meaningful action is how can we lift up other other voices and I saw a post by Lizzo actually 
this morning she was talking about I don't want to be part of the body she talks about body positivity but she's like I just want to be part of a body normative yeah I saw that approach and I, yeah I shared that because you know we that's the end goal isn't it we get to the point where all bodies are normal yeah because what is normal really and like I think when we talk about body positivity and diet culture we have to talk about white supremacy and racism yeah. and how it all ties in together because it's diet culture is another extension of white supremacy. You know, it creates the hierarchy of bodies. It's exclusive. It's oppressive. Um, and so you, I think that is where it becomes so much more than just us being thin, you know, mm. it's about how um, diet culture actually does impact, um, you know, pe- people that aren't thin and white so it definitely goes a a lot deeper than just loving our belly rolls yeah that's what absolutely and i i when we think about it as you say we need to have conversations around health inequalities in every across the board yeah across the board and policy government policy and you know um uh kind of like we have these upstream approaches but these the importance of downstream approaches as well in terms Mm -hmm. of addressing those issues and you you can't have one without the other can you you've got to have conversations about all of it about all of it um i don't know about you because of us being in the uk but i find i don't feel like there's as much available to us in regards to this approach as there seems to be like in the states um you know i even i googled hayes uk before we came on and um that was that hasn't been active for a few years and and I, I do think that's an issue for us at the moment we we get we have to get a lot of our information don't we from um you know research out there in the states and from the accounts in, in the states i do think that we're lacking it in the uk definitely um but that doesn't mean that we can't continue with our approaches yeah. in our small little areas yeah because I, for me that is part of um Okay, so when you start to learn about everything, the, the anti-racism, the body positivity, you can start to feel a little bit like, so how do I fit into this? What, what is it that I do? How can I have an impact? And I do actually believe that divesting from diet culture is an act of resistance. And so we are part of the resistance to a system, you know, that is harming people. Mm. So I like to see that as, you know rather than getting overwhelmed of oh gosh like I don't know what I can do I can't change policy on my own I don't you know I'm not sure what approach to take it's about getting really clear about your purpose and where you can make a difference I think in your um, practice every day yeah I love that I love that and I I have a little I have a little saying that I say in my own world I say I'm trying to gather whispers because if we can gather enough whispers we'll become a roar and that's because mm-hmm. that's what it feels like. It feels like diet culture is such a massive storm. It's so strong still. It's worth so much freaking money. Yeah, I know. That it feels sometimes I, you know, personally, I do get, I do think, oh my God, I'm like banging my head against a brick wall. But then I think every time I finish working with a client who has made that change and then they're doing it and they're passing that on to their own kids, I think yeah. that is that every small, every small win is worth it's it. It's amazing, because, definitely. Yeah. And yeah then, and it's go on sorry oh no 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 no. I was just going to say how does that come about in your you must have seen that in your own work people who've come to you who have had you know quite a disordered relationship with movement or exercise in the past how does that mm-hmm. kind of how have you seen that so what out? I'm discovering in my clients because I, I'm new I'm a new business I didn't really start until January and I haven't had that many clients but what I have seen in all of them is it's almost as if they all had this innate knowing themselves that they could trust their bodies and that they could access Mm. movement. But because of all the years of conditioning around diet culture, I think they just needed that support and guidance for the acceptance that it's okay. You can, if you don't want to go and lift weights for an hour, you can just go for a hike. You know, you can go for a walk around your state. Um, So for me, it's, it's that when the clients suddenly become aware that I can make up my own rules in, in regards to how I move my body and it doesn't have to be X, Y, Z. Um, Cause I encourage my clients to go off program 
I encourage them to not listen to me. You know, you are the authority of your body. Um, And even the breakthroughs that a lot of them get with being able to rest without feeling guilty. Um, So taking rest days, listening to their body and not moving when they know that it won't help. Or um, also on the other end, I have clients who have had to work around just doing the 10 minutes and that being enough because we've been conditioned to believe that, you know, it's all or nothing in the gym. You go and you give it, go hard or go home, you know? So when you're saying just do 10 minutes there at first, like, well, is that going to be enough? Are you like, is that all you feel like doing? Yeah. Just do 10 minutes. That's enough. That's fine. And it's that revelation that, do you know what? I can make up my own rules and I can listen to my body and I can do what feels supportive to me in that moment. And I think because you take away the, um, you know, the, the weight loss and me- so we don't measure our progress. We don't do any progress photos, nothing like that. So they can clearly focus on their voice inside and their relationship with exercise without any of the distraction of yeah. the stuff that doesn't really mean anything. No, and it's so empowering, isn't it? When you see that switch in them, and when mm-hmm. a client says to you things like, oh, do you know what? I've just got more energy. I find it easier to wake up. Or yeah. um, my moods are so much sta- more stable. You know, I'm not like snapping mm-hmm. at the kids so much. You know, all of those changes, are, that, that's the value. That's the yeah. life enhancing stuff, isn't it? It is. And also like um, a few of my clients have said that they've had the feelings come up, you know, of, oh, like I should be losing weight like why isn't this happening but they're able to kind of recognize these feelings but not act on them and I think again that is another big a big um you know learn learning a development growth we can have those thoughts because they're not going to go away we live in a weight centric society it's like Mm. pushed down our throats day in day out so I think it would be unrealistic of us to believe that those thoughts will ever go but it's been able to see them recognize them know that they're not true and like just move on brush them move yes. on yeah move on yeah <laughs> so that's amazing that pause isn't it it's when we mm-hmm. when, i think the key is when people get to work with someone like yourself and they become aware because it's the first time people i think people become aware when you can stand outside of it and go oh my god actually yeah that is how it made me feel and I hated Mm -hmm. every part of it when we've got that awareness we can build in that kind of like pause as you say those kind of like policing thoughts they're not going to necessarily disappear but then you can just retort you can come back and go no actually I feel better when I you know jog on and I also think it's about validating our clients and affirming them that the 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 desire to lose weight may still be there and Mm -hmm. it's it's valid you know, they're mm-hmm. allowed to feel like that in this society that we live in. But what I tend to try and coach around now is like you say, what what would you be willing to give up? You know, and, and a lot of them are in a different space where they're just not willing to go back down that road. So once they actually weigh it up, it's, it just becomes less desirable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I, I think there's also something there about the fact that there'll always be something else. When you go down that kind of train of thought, that kind of like linear thinking of, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to lose weight or so forth from the Mm -hmm. stuff. My brother's not on this call today, but he's a PT who co-founded Reframe with me. And he said he's worked with clients, men, especially he he gets quite a few um, men presenting with body dysmorphia more and more frequently, thanks to social media images where he, you know, Jim's like, these guys are jacked up on steroids. This isn't something, yeah. you know, they're just trying to flog you their protein shake. This isn't achievable, but that's the thing. That's that kind of mm-hmm. mindset is when will it ever be enough as well? So actually the minute we can kind of decouple from it and say, that's not my validator. The comparison isn't where I need to be. Yeah. It's what's going on inside me. Then that's massively freeing, isn't it? Yeah. And that was another side that I discovered from working casually in the gyms that, oh, it's not, it's all smoke and mirrors for a lot of people. You know, um, there was a lot of people will talk about doing, you know, oh, it's all about dedication, no excuses, but don't talk about the fat burners that, and the PUDs that they're taking, you know, so 
I was like, oh my goodness, this is, it just felt really deceptive. That's mm. a really, I think I got to the point where this is totally unethical. It's really deceptive. I do not feel very aligned to this industry. And that was one of the reasons why I went to university as well, because I thought I can't stop at just being a personal trainer. There is no space for me here. I cannot work in this industry. But luckily at university, that's where I happened upon health at every size. So there was a way forward. <laughs> Yeah, and it is an amazing movement, isn't it? I've just done, I think I mentioned to you, Fiona Willer's um, CPD and non-diet approach, which is like the clinical fallout of um, health at every size. But once you read the papers, once you read, because I wrote it in my reflective practice afterwards, once you read the papers, you cannot, once you know the data, once you know the evidence, you think mm -hmm. to yourself, I could not ever put anyone on a weight centric formalized or weight loss plan when I know what the risks of that are um, and the risk of failure and so forth mm -hmm. it would be unethical yeah unethical no, that's yeah. the word <laughs> it's unethical it, and it is that feeling of I couldn't I couldn't ever ever hang my hat in that arena again because it is once you know the truth and it is the truth of the matter <laughs> I know. Well, this was where we all started to click for me at university. Um, I did my dissertation on do diets work? Um, and that involved, you know, um, going through a few, quite a few peer reviewed studies and getting to the conclusion that it's a very tiny percentage. And yeah. even then, what, what behaviors are they, you know, what, mm. what are they doing to like stay at that weight? Um, but for me, it was such an eye opener because I had never questioned dieting before, before university, mm. nobody had ever said, Oh, diets don't work. It was always you, you're not, it's you, you're the failure. You're not trying hard enough. You try this instead, try it this way, exercise more. So there's never, there's never anything that says like, Oh, it's the diet that's not working. It was only until I started reading the research and I was like, what why are we not told this and yeah. and then you get to the ethical like why is there no informed consent like why are we yeah. not told about the danger well da the harm you know that can be associated yeah. with attempting weight loss intentionally so yeah um i got to that point where it would be it would be unethical to continue down the road of um mm. trying to sell intentional weight loss yeah totally agree totally agree but have you experienced any kind of pushback against that within your industry I know that I I personally in my world have come against you know people that think you know they have a very um they don't understand the nuances of the non-diet approach they don't understand the you know um, the nuances of intuitive eating and you know they have been like you know you're not health promoting well no that's actually mm -hmm. quite the opposite I am fully health yeah. promoting um but you know what kind of like have you experienced any pushback from um to be fair I haven't mostly because I work online and I chose specifically to work online I, th I think I got to the realization that especially locally there was no gym that I was going to be able to work at that would accommodate me because mm -hmm. even the that gym where I'd first work casually they expected you to weigh clients they expected you to take progress pictures you know I was told I would have to look the part um so I think because of that I just knew that I'd have to carve out my own area within the fitness industry so I haven't actually come up against the resistance in that way but it's just knowing that there's no space for me outside if I did decide oh I want to go and do this in real life I think I would come up against the resistance then mm. have you do you think there's a shift today I mean I don't know about you but um I have noticed some more of the more overt male voices especially in PT on social media have begun to kind of like just begin to creep into the space um, you know, start talking about diets don't work long term, start presenting some of the evidence. And I wonder, you know, I, I this is it's the cynic in me. I wonder how much of that is jumping on the bandwagon, or is there a true kind of um movement? I mean, as a I mean, I think within the female space definitely, but I I don't I mean I don't know. Do you what are your thoughts on it? 
Well, I've, I must admit, I've probably created a bit of an echo chamber for myself okay. online. I've tend of like, I yeah, haven't yeah. followed a lot of accounts. However, there was one that I did have to unfollow recently. I had followed along because I did feel like they was getting it. But then, then you realise they're actually still promoting weight loss, but maybe in a less overt yeah, way. Overt way. And they're still using that O word a lot. And you think, so you haven't re so you've, Okay, you're catching on that diets don't work, but you haven't gone further into weight stigma and, mm. you know, how it's not just about diets not working. We've got to look at the whole reasons why diet work and how, you know, how mm. diet culture affects people. So I know what you mean. I can feel a shift, but at the moment I'm a bit cynical and I think yeah. it may be based on being performative and trying to tap into a market that they can see is growing. gaining traction yeah yeah no and I, and I think and that sort of goes back to the 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 when we talk about the whitewashing of movements as well mm -hmm. is that kind of like oh well I, i'm gonna pick this part yeah i'm gonna take this part and i'm gonna pay lip service to it and then i'm gonna crank it out in a way that feels and i did i was reflecting i've been reflecting this week since we chatted on email and i thought to myself i do wonder and this is me being really really honest and transparent I wonder if it's easier for people to take the intuitive eating, the non-diet message from me, because I look like me. Yeah, and I think that's the area where we have to consider the ways that we take up space, isn't it? And mm. um, we, we, we don't want to become gatekeepers ourselves. I've, you yeah. know, I'm becoming quite aware of that. Like, I try not to post so much of myself on my Great. newsfeed anymore um because yeah that is a problem i don't know if you was part of the um amplify melanated voices that was mm -hmm. a couple of months ago so i did actually mute a lot of um fellow white providers and it was so so many more messages came through from you know um black activists fat activists and it made me realize actually how much space we do take up within Instagram. So I do agree that it can, some people would probably believe us, but that is something that we have to push back against and redirect, yeah. constantly redirect people to yeah. where the, where we received education from and the messages from. So mm. yeah. Um, yeah, that's why I think anti-racism work most definitely has to be involved in what we do too, because that teaches us that we shouldn't be looking to white people as the authority on anything. You know, we should, it's a collective. Yeah. You know, it should yeah, be a, collect like a yeah. collective. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, could, I mean, for, for our members who are looking to like diversify their feed um, and follow accounts that are not only going to diversify in terms of the kind of like body shapes they're looking at um, within the health and fitness industry, but in terms of like educating themselves on, on where movement has come from where would where would you suggest you some good accounts that you would suggest following or areas to look at um i can set i can send you over a resource for that but, but what i would suggest first is if if ever we because it's not just about diversifying our news feed is it we have to go further no. than that and i would say start with i started with Leila saad's me and white supremacy it yeah. was a challenge on instagram but she now has a book available and if you start there if you start there because you need to know not how not to approach people's spaces like if you're gonna if you're gonna be following a more um have a more diverse news feed then you also need to know how to how to take up space how to not take up space yeah. how to not cause harm you've got to be careful that you're not um using people as resources you know so i would actually say before i tell you to go and follow people i would say read me and white supremacy and do do a bit of work around how we take up space within communities i think layla actually has got an igtv around um like us white women taking up space which i can try and find and forward to that you would be great and then we could put it in the show notes and i'd love to watch it um, and I know that's something that I need to work on because whilst I still, um, you know, I talk a lot about body diversity and I intellectually want to learn about the history, I mm -hmm. get 
I get scared of getting it wrong. And that's yeah. my white fragility, but I get scared of screwing it up. And that mm -hmm. can make me sometimes hold back. And it's, you know, getting over that as well mm -hmm. is important yeah. part of the process, isn't it? Well, that's why I definitely would recommend Layla's workbook because it covers all of that. It covers all of yeah. that. Um, it, and it's like, an in, what I loved about Layla's challenge was that it's an internal process. Um, because once we learn the internal process, we can then begin to question, you know, our own beliefs. But then I think it's really important to start learning about the systems. And that's what I was going to say. Another book that I've just finished reading is um, Ibram Kendi's Has Been Anti-Racist. And then you learn the history about actually how racism was constructed. Because I do believe that if we're going to work towards deconstructing something, we have to learn about how it was constructed yeah. in the first place. Um, so it would just, I do think we have to be careful about how we take up space. And that is like, as great as it is to, to follow and support people's work, we need to do so in a way that is not going to cause them any harm. harm. Yeah, so that's why I would just say, just educate ourselves first around that. And then, you know, um, I'll be happy to send you a list of people that I follow and amazing people. Fabulous. And that's a really, yeah, you've made such an important point there. Such a valuable and important point. Yeah, so definitely let's um, start where we need to start so we get it mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And your, your mum? You're a mum too, I mean, they're growing up fast, but you've got, you know, your daughter's currently navigating her teenage years. I mean, how yeah. would you like things to be different for the next generation as well? I mean, I think, it, I don't know about you, but I feel like it's, as much as there was a lot of crap when we were growing up, um, you know, the, the most comparison I got was watching Clueless. Now <laughs> with the um, social media, I just feel like it's a harder game again, isn't it? Yeah, I was thinking about this question. I did write a few things down. Um, I ha have to be honest, it terrifies me. I'm, um, I'm a size, I'm a UK size 18, so I'm plus size myself. I'm not, my, my daughter sees my body, you know, I, I'm very neutral around bodies. Her, and yet she's still picked up um, yeah. things. She said, you know, she talks about her bum shape. She won't let me take pictures without, um, she won't have pictures taken without it being on Snapchat because of the filters. Um, she won't let me post pictures. And it's just terrifying because I think even though I'm, I'm what's the word, modeling, I'm modeling a weight neutral approach. Like we've got no scales in this house. We've, you know, yeah, we don't do anything yeah. like that. And yet she's still, um, been, you know she's absorbing what's out there in society and other family members friends you know so I, I think it's worrying when when you think about it like now it's not just um magazines and photos sharp, sharp like it was when we was younger it's enhancements you know feel, they, they've got apps for face tune body tune and um it's like this unreal it's when, when we speak about an unrealistic um, beauty ideal back when it was Photoshop, now it's the cosmetic surgeries and Botox at the age of 23, lip fillers, and I'm, it's terrifying. It really is. So that doesn't sound very positive, does it? <laughs> no, no, but it's, I think it's, you, you it's make scary. Really, yeah, you make such a valid point because, you know, equally, I'm a mum and I, uh, we, we haven't, I've have not had scales in my house for over 20 years. I mean, because of my own disordered eating, I've not touched them since recovery. So my children have never weighed themselves. Um, I'm very neutral about language. I'm very neutral about <laughs> food. Um, I try and model all kinds of, you know, movement. I try and model rest, you know, do everything. Yeah. Because I want to protect, I don't ever want them to feel the way I felt. But yeah, it's very it's really, really hard because they go to school and already yeah. there are girls in the class going, oh no, I shouldn't eat that. Or mm -hmm. carbs are bad or because they're yeah. inheriting it from their own families, their own parents, these sets of beliefs. So I, yeah. I, from my point of view, I think to myself, I keep thinking to myself in the same way, I can't stop your heart being broken. I can't stop all the things that I would not like to happen to you happen. Um, if I can just 
help them stay aware Mm -hmm. so you know when you went back to saying about how with your clients they have the voices but learning to not necessarily turn that voice into an action yeah I think maybe if is maybe that's the secret I don't know do we help them understand that that those things aren't going to go anywhere but we can support them to kind of intercept things differently yeah okay I try to see it as we're laying the foundation and we, we're creating an anchor so that they're not going to be children you know at one point they're going to grow up and they're going to they're probably going to come to their own realizations and they'll have that foundation that we've helped them to build so maybe that's something that they'll come home to because I think often about my mom's relationship and with food and dieting and she didn't diet or she was very neutral around food there was never she never spoke about our weight um so my mom was actually she, my mom I suppose modeled just having a normal relationship relationship with, yeah yeah food diet exercise um so yeah I feel like at the grand old age of 40 <laughs> I'm anchoring into those things you know that my mom modeled like so as I hope it doesn't take our children until they get to 40 yeah. hopefully we're a bit further forward with things um I, but I do think we we kind of can't feel hopeless we have to think we are creating these foundations that mm-hmm. hopefully one day they will they will be able to come back to and use mm-hmm. and it's just hard isn't it to watch them go through the process and look I really struggle with I don't want to validate Evie with her body and be like but but you there's nothing wrong you've got you know your figure's fine I don't want to do any of that either because what I'm very conscious of is her body could change again and I don't want her to think that that one specific body she's in now is the one that she should aspire to so it's really hard isn't it to be like quite intentional with your own language around things Uh, so I've always taught that look bodies change bodies change because of your hormones because of life circumstances i try and teach her that your body will change throughout life and different Mm. circumstances and that's completely normal um so that is kind of the message that i'm trying to drive home that your body is never going to stay the same it will always change yeah i that's that's a really wonderful way of positioning it um something i you know you mentioned earlier about with your clients under recovering or kind of like struggle and I think most if not all of my clients struggle with the concept of rest and giving themselves permission to whether or not it's within exercise or just like generally mm-hmm. resting yeah. um, because they feel guilty because they feel yeah. like they need to be productive all the time and I do in all cases it's women what in your minds because obviously you know we talk a lot about health promoting behaviors but so it goes beyond food and exercise doesn't it I mean from your point of view what does that look like what does self-care look like because i have mental health um mental illness i have depression and anxiety i've actually had to come to the acceptance that i may need to do things that i don't necessarily want to do so that i can be function tomorrow does that make sense so yeah i've had to i've had to reclaim the word self-discipline for myself because self-discipline to me triggered me so much in regards to like diet culture and everything Mm. but I've never been able to use to come back to it as an act of self-care so this sounds it doesn't sound revolutionary at all but it is for me so I force myself to like wash up daily and then it has such a massive impact on my well-being the the next day that I wake up to a clean kitchen and I can't believe that I'm that that is like a non-negotiable value that I'm saying I have to make myself wash up. Um, so I think it's not only knowing when to rest, I'm, I'm quite good at that now, giving myself permission. I know I can feel when I need to rest mm-hmm. and not feeling at all guilty about it. But it's also knowing when I do need to do the things that I don't necessarily want to do. Um, and it's very strange to reclaim that outside of diet culture. Do you know what I mean? Because we're not talking about punishment mm. and um, like doing the punishing exercising and all that. It's about like simple things that, like the washing up, that is part of my self care toolkit. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that's a very strange way of saying that 
it's about all these behaviours that we once associated with dope culture and all these words and um, things that come up. It, I think you have to kind of push everything away and then you can come back to a place where you can sort through the things, the, the, the words that are actually quite helpful. I don't know. It's a very long journey and pr process of figuring out the things that work. Sometimes we have to put a framework back around ourselves. Yes, yes. Because and, I, I, that, that's yeah. it. So you reject it. So I rejected it totally when yeah. I was going through the journey. I didn't do any structured exercise. You know, I kind of rejected all of these beliefs and narratives. But now that I've kind of healed in a way, I can come back and be like, no, I can bring structure back to my life. Yeah. I can have a framework to work from. And it's a supportive, intuitive. Yeah. But yeah okay yeah, we've got that exactly that is <laughs> exactly that it is a framework and that's I mean that's one of the nuances of the whole kind of like intuitive thing is intuitive um movement and intuitive eating is very much about you know you have to re reject diet culture you have to reject that mentality but it's also acknowledging within that there's that gray area of whilst we're relearning or even after we've been through the journey those frameworks can be supportive so using our yeah. knowledge some, you know, sometimes we have to use our knowledge, our intellectual mm -hmm. knowledge versus the, you know, the feeling. So as you say, exactly that, the feeling might be, I'm really tired, I don't want to wash up. But your knowledge knows, that actually, if I get, if I do that now, I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to be able to approach my day from a yeah. more positive place. Yeah. And the same goes with eating, you know, you know, intuitive, the client's always, there's that gray area it gets intuitive eating get peddled as like hunger and fullness which it isn't that's like mm -hmm. one of ten principles but you know and i say to my clients we can put a framework around your eating it's like putting stabilizers back on and mm -hmm. using your knowledge that actually if i i know i might not want to eat an afternoon snack but i know if i don't I'm going to feel pretty crappy yeah. and then I'll end up using my phone too much and I'll end up opening the bottle of wine, you know, and it's, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's that balance, yeah, definitely. But I do think you have to go through that stage of, um, it's a bit like I first heard the term in a podcast with Laura Thomas, but I do believe it was Jess Baker that first came up with the pendulum swing. That So you go from diet culture to like, um, we, nothing reject it all mm -hmm. and then you can you Come find back. that balance back in the middle yeah. and i think that's where i am now and if you had an opportunity then to like speak to the whole world if karen was on top yeah. of the mountain you, could, you all have my attention what would you want to share with people oh this is such a hard question um sorry karen someone once <laughs> someone asked someone once asked me it and i went oh that's a good one <laughs> oh well i think considering how things are at the moment i would literally stand on top of the mountain and say we all need each other you know we are all as important as each other mm -hmm. and we all need to work together in collaboration for, to build strong and just and safe communities i think that's what i would want to say that you know we are all as valuable as each other and we all should work in collaboration with each other and to create a more peaceful and just and safe society <laughs> so. karen i think that's probably one of the best answers we've had okay to create a strong just and safe society i think that yeah, yeah that's pretty cool in my book so yeah um i just want to say a massive thank you for coming on today you have been inspiring and you've helped me reflect and um yeah i'm very grateful for you coming into um the reframe club and chatting to us today thank you for having me it's been lovely thank you for tuning in and we hope you have taken something away from listening perhaps one small action you can put into practice today. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's episode, so pop on over to Reframe Club where you can share them, your own reflections and experiences. We would love to hear from you. As always, here at Reframe Club, we are rooting for you.